It's time for us to turn our attention to hurling. I'm delighted to say James Scahill is with us. James, that was quite the weekend of hurling. Um, we're kind of waiting for the football championship to take off, but Jesus, the hurling championship exploded into life. I don't know where to start. Yeah. We could start with the penalty, but maybe we'd be better off actually starting with Galway going out against Dublin. Yeah, what a place to start this time of the morning. <laughs> um, it was a very, very it was, it was, it was, it was a poor game. Let's be honest about it, guys. Um, I was expecting an awful lot more from Galway. I think everybody was. Um, I, I came away very, very disheartened. Like there was an awful lot of things that were done badly by Galway. Like if I can, I can take mistakes and I can take, you know, errors and bad shooting, but I just can't take lack of passion, lack of, you know, lack of fight, lack of heart. You know, we didn't show up at all at all. So. That was the most disappointing aspect for me. And then when you lose a game of that magnitude, it puts you into uh, a, a basically a, a condensed championship now, which makes always task all, all the harder to get to an Ireland final. And um, I can't take away from Dublin either. They obviously analysed Galway to the T. They, they looked at Cahill Manning and said, if we can shut him down, we go a long way to shutting Galway down. They did exactly that. Um, they, they got their good, good players on the ball. Their good players did the damage. And uh, they got the right scores when it was needed. So credit, credit to Dublin and credit to Magic Guinea that they were full, full value for the victory. But from a Galway perspective, there's a lot of soul searching to do. If, if you're in that dressing room, James, in those scenarios where you feel that coming away from the game there wasn't enough fight or enough heart, do you ever manage to come to a realisation in the week afterwards as, as to why that was? Yeah, we, we uh, I, I, I kind of experienced something similar myself in, in 2013 uh, at Leinster final against Dublin as well, ironically. And uh, there was, I'll be honest about it, there was a level of complacency within, within the team at that time and our preparations were okay. You know, they weren't terribly, terribly sharp. And in the day, the day after, we actually we had to call a meeting ourselves, amongst ourselves, uh, in, in the Lockery Hotel to discuss, you know, the whole debacle. Um, because we knew from ourselves, we, we set standards in training, and they weren't met on the pitch uh, on the day of the game, and we had to kind of find out why. And so there was a good there was a good few harsh conversations had. There was some constructive criticism. Uh, there was no real finger pointing as such. And I'd imagine something very similar could happen, you know, this week, uh, today, tomorrow, because... We, as you can see now, let's say Galway haven't got the time to to wait a week or wait two weeks. You know that the draw is going to be made tomorrow. I think so they're going to they're going to know their opponents immediately. They're going to have to try and bury that game as soon as they can. Uh, so that's that's getting it over the way today tomorrow. And you know, it just looked like what well, something that really stood out to me at, at the weekend was when I watched the game after the Kilkenny Wexford game. It looked like that Kilkenny were practicing hurling, you know, and that Galway were practicing systems because even Galway's their whole demeanour around the ball, they're, they were so lethargic, they, 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 their first touch, their, their jab lips, you know, hand passing, the most basic of skill that you teach young guys was off the pace entirely. And that only really happens really as such when your head is off the pace, you know what I mean? And I was just looking and Dublin created a pace of a game that Galway just, they went with, so Galway didn't try to change it up at all. The puckouts were lethargic, the sidelines were lethargic, the freeze were lethargic, you know, everything was just, it looked like it was drained of energy and they got no spark, you know, so... No, no, no player created a spark. No, no player created something that the, the crowd could get behind. That the rest of the team could g up, you know. And, and when they did, then that was then coupled by, you know, a, a couple of errors after a game. So essentially, it was one step forward, two steps back, and they just couldn't couldn't get after the game. So there will be a lot of soul searching done today, tomorrow, and uh, and they're going to have to just bury that game as soon as they can because there's no point dwelling on it. You know, they can't change results at this stage. So there's there's a lot to discuss, but there's a lot to do as well. Is that fixable? Uh, or it, it is fixable, like. like I'll be honest, it's terribly hard to fix. Like I would, I'd like a lot more time. You know, like I'm, I'm seeing there. There's, there's something in the region of five, six games in 35 days. We're getting to the Royal final. That's, you know, that's, that's a serious amount of, you know, battling to do to get to the Ireland final. And you're going to come up against a team like in like Limerick or probably Tipperary who are going to have one or two games less. You know, in a longer period of time. So, the the result of yet the the, the the issue with just results is performance. Yes, absolutely. But then further down the line is also how much they have to do in such a short space of time. And we saw last year that we had to go through, you know, the, the, the qualifiers as well, but we had one game less and we still came up and, and lost a bit of energy against Limerick in the semi final. So the ramifications of yesterday are, are, are quite severe. But I, I do think <clears throat> some of the senior members now of the team are going to have to really, really grab this by the scruff of the neck and just try and fix it as best they can. It's, it's going to be an attitude, an attitude change. And I, I, I reckon if they had an in house match this evening, they'd knock them out of one another, you know, just to. To kind of get rid of some of that frustration because the performance was was so below par, you know, so below par. Uh, but as I said before, credit to Dublin, you know, it, for sure. Like it's it's ju it is just so unusual when we have these conversations. But but it's even more unusual, James, when you have people in the squad 
who know what it takes to win an All Ireland. They've been there. They they they, they know exactly the level he had to get to those few years ago to actually get over the line. So they know yeah. in training if something's off, I presume. Yeah, it's kind of a... I use the phrase, you know, fool me once, you know, shame mm. on you, fool me twice, shame on me. We, we've been there before. You know, we, we, we've had these performances. Like We know that when we come up to Pro Park, with even a percent of complacency or, or, or any kind of lack of energy towards the game, we're going to be getting caught, you know. And like Galway, <clears throat> we've won five All-Irelands in the last 100 years. You know, we've won 5% of the All-Ireland Championships. Like, so it's not as if we have a God-given right to go up and just take home any kind of results or cup, you know. So that, that really should be in the back of guys' minds. You know, we're not like the King of Tipperary who have 30 odd, where if you're on a panel for 10 years, you're nearly guaranteed to get an alert. You know, so that has to really sink into the guys, you know, that like every game they go up to go back, they're going to have to really put in a massive shift, no matter who they're playing, you know, nowadays. <clears throat> because every team, as I said, is as fit as each other, is as strong as each other. It's going to come down to the day and who wants it. And everybody wants to win. That's, that's, that's obvious. But who has the bigger will to win? That's the bigger one. You know, we all go up, we want to win. Yeah, it'd be lovely to go up and and get the results and come home fantastic. But the will to win has got to be uh, way higher than the want to win, you know? And that's where we're completely out fault. That was, that was the worrisome issue. And then when we brought on some substitutes, let's say, and I just listened to the commentary on the game, and the, the phrase was, we, we have a lot of experience coming on now. This is a very experienced hurler coming on. And, you know, maybe that wasn't the right thing to do was bring on experience because if we were in front, you know, experience would count nearly for a bit more, do you know what I mean? Whereas when you're kind of behind, you're looking for a spark, you're looking for a bit of pace, a bit of energy, something to ignite the performance, because that wasn't there at all, you know. So I would have liked to see more energy come off the bench, you know. Like I, I just I use a guy like Kevin Cooney, who would be <clears throat> Joseph Cooney's younger brother, you know, ma massive pace. He could have done damage in there. Jared Mannion, the massive pace. I'd have loved to see them guys come in and just give them a chance, you know, because the game was going so bad anyways. You know, <laughs> what was the difference? Like just put, throw them in, get them some championship experience, and see how they go on, you know, because we don't know if they're chested at all yet. So. Look, there's a lot to get answered, both on the pitch and off the pitch, you know, from our perspective. And so what, in, t in terms of that leadership group, is it they, they need to get together, talk amongst themselves, and then present back to management about what they think went wrong and try and become unified that way? Yeah, it's something like a couple of efforts. So you'll obviously have uh, the players group will have assessed the game in real time. You know, they'll have, they'll have felt what was going on. They'll have, you can get a vibe in a game too, you can feel what way a game is going away from you. Even for me watching the game, I could, I could put myself in, in, in their shoes and you can feel the vibe is not good. You know, certain instances like, and, and the things like the 20 yard, one yard free at the very start and then a second shot saved in the goal and then a couple of wise, you can just think, oh God, we're in for a dogfight here against these guys and that's the last thing you want, you know. So the players would have a sense of what they felt in real time. Players in would obviously, I would assume they'd have gone back and watched the game yesterday and then try catch it and see what they're watching on screen did it match what they felt in real time the piece all that together didn't say as a leadership group and as a team right and they'll confer them with the management who have obviously watched the analysis you know that's is one thing let's say but the actual performance itself to see what were the major issues and you're going to have to pick probably two or three major major things they're going to have to alter um you can't go back with 10 11 points you haven't got time for that and plus players are not going to retain that much information mm. they will possibly retain three points of note and those two, three or four points of note you're going to have to just introduce into a training exercise or a training regime over the next couple of weeks and try and fix that this week. You know, because as I said earlier, we, you don't have the time to go through, you know, we're not in pre-season now, so we don't have six, seven weeks to a game. We've got 13 days. The draw is tomorrow. We've got essentially four or five days this week to fix what went on last Saturday. And then we've got a week to prepare for the next team. You know, so it's a real, it's a real war of attrition. So what, to answer your question right, rightfully, you're going to have an assessment from the players, an assessment from the management, they piece it together, and then pull, pull forward three or four major points that they're going to have to improve drastically if they're going to move forward. Let, let's talk about the, the Wexford Kilkenny game. You talked about um, the, the skill set of the Kilkenny players in particular, uh, and it looked like mm -hmm. they were practicing the skills of hurling. Were you taken aback a little bit by Wexford? Because I, I think largely most of us had kind of thought that Wexford's race had been run, but that was a performance which is up there with almost any of the ones they've had over the last couple of years. Yeah, we, we, we get these games from time to time. Um, like, and it just it happened to be Kikini Wexford uh, this weekend. And it was just, you know, it's exactly what the doctor ordered. You know, we, we, we as a hurling community, like, and as a fan base, you know, and as a country, I think, needed that game. We needed that level of excitement. And it was just an absolute enthralling game. And I, full credit to Wexford, I would have wrote them off. Um, I was actually going, thinking in my own head that Kilkenny, Galway, uh, Tipperary and Limerick would win by a cumulative 30 points. That was what was in my head over the weekend. 
And, you know, I'm, I was, not, not, I was obviously wrong with Galway, but yourself, but <laughs> Wexford did a, did a fantastic showing. They just, the, the game plan they, they utilised was what we've seen before, a real running energy game. And the way the game petered out, uh, we're going to have to go on for 90 minutes. Just, they hadn't got it in the legs. And that's what that's one way of assessing. But then I also Kikini, they tracked Wexford, they marked Wexford, they hit them with every tackle, they stopped every run in that last twenty minutes. And you know, they're never beaten. They're the hardest team in the world to beat because they have that what would you call it? It's an insatiable hunger, you know. Um and I, it's, it's credit to Brian Cordy, who was who was at the helm for twenty odd years this I don't even know at this stage. Um I was probably in national school when he took off, but like he he has this drive built into him and it's it's, I think it's so hard for any of those squads to replicate, and it's very hard to even explain or to point out. But you, when you meet them, they're like they're just they're frothing at the mouth nearly. It's the best way they can put it to, to get at the ball, to get at you, to put in a tackle, and it's it's all the guys that come on. So they're, they're bench uh, they contributed in the region of one nine, which was which was huge. Westwood is one one, and Kinney managed the game very well when they went to man down. They, they did excellently, really, when they lost their goalkeeper a huge, and after conceding the penalty. And you can touch on that further now with the game that went on yesterday. But Wexford surprised me they did with their performance. Um, I will think they'd be very disappointed with regard to being three points up and time up. Um, also, they had a man, obviously, as I just spoke, they were a man up and just neutralised. It, it kind of had flashbacks of the Tipperary game in 2019, whereby they had a man up and they just their puck out strategy didn't work. So can you give them the ball to stay in their own 45 yard line from puck outs? And then just, they invited Wexford on and just, I think it was tired bodies, tired minds, and can you just shut them down? They forced Wexford to make mistakes. And Kikini close out the game. And then they brought on big players who created big, big moments. Hence, while, while he watched his goal, Owen Murphy save again, uh, who would be thanking the lucky stars with, with Hawkeye, you know. That, but like, again, when he was counted to get over a mistake like that, and make a great save that he did on, on Rory Connor, it was a credit to them. And uh, they're, they're going to be full value for, for favourites in, in the Lynch final. OK, let's talk about the, the penalty issue in the Clare tip game. with The, the penalty in the sin bin results from a foul, which is quite far from goal. And... Uh, the criticism of the referee in all of the papers today is unstoppable. There's like nothing that James Owens did right in that scenario, according to everybody in the papers today. Do you have any sympathy with him applying the law and being forced to apply the law as it's written, or do you think, screw that, use your common sense and don't ruin the game? Uh, no sympathy whatsoever. None. Um, we need common sense. We need people with a level head. Uh, in, in, in those situations to, to look around them and to assess what could have, could have happened, you know, say obviously when he, when he assesses how many clear guys are going to be back. So Jake Morris is on the 21, on the sideline. He's just about to rise the ball. When he rises the ball, that's catch number one. So he's got one catch right there. He's now got 35 yards to travel with one catch left. You know, I, I think people haven't realised that. And mm -hmm. Clare have two defenders plus a goalie back. So what you're going to have is Jake Morris will take the ball through seven or eight yards. As soon as contact going to come, he's going to have to catch again. That's catch number two gone. Now he's got to strike it. Now he's still 25 yards away from goal. That is not a goal scoring chance. For me, the rule is to be applied as such. It's a bit like soccer, when, when there's a last man back, and if you tackle the last man back to one goal, it's, it's, it's a red card. For me, hurling is the same thing. There needs to be clear sight of the goalie. The forward has to be one on one, clear through, on with the goalie, and the forward in, or the back, excuse me, pulls him down cynically. That, that was the, the objective of the rule. That's why we saw. There so many issues in the years previous with guys nearly rubble tackling guys coming down. That's the that's the, the actual situation the rules should be applied to. Like what James Owens did there, and I don't think anyone's touched on this, as I said about the goal performance, the ramifications of such a decision are absolutely huge. And I can see why Brian Lohan, and credit actually to Brian Lohan, in every interview that I've seen after, he's been very cool and composed, which I hope feeds into his team. But the decision was so ludicrous, it's the only word I can use, that the ramification that has that for clear season is massive. You're now taking a group of guys from Clare who've trained for months. You've you've created a decision like that out of madness, let's say, from, from James Owen's perspective. And you've ruined their Munster Championship and put them into a dogfight with teams <clears throat> over the next four or five weeks. You know, And people will say, oh, Clare didn't react well for the 10 minutes. But they're after, they were actually after getting two or three sucker punches. That sim bin would have frustrated a team. And I can guarantee you it fed into the whole team because of how outrageous the decision was. And they just didn't recover. They conceded the penalty and then... Or Eva Quilligan made a made a simple error for a second goal of of James Cam third goal, excuse me, and that's just that was it. That was the fight over, and that was kind of strike one. Strike two is when the fact that there was no consistency at all applied when Aaron Shanahan was fouled uh, up up the far side a few minutes later. That just that probably galled the the, the clear supporters and and Brian Lohan as a whole. And I understand 
And putting myself in clear shoes here, first and foremost, as a player, you would have prepared vigorously over the last couple of months waiting for this championship. They were well primed. They were well in the game, very, very well in the game. And uh, then a decision of that just comes and it hampers the whole game. The contest essentially was over. It was gone. The whole thing petered out. It became a challenge game. I know the results showed four points of a lead for our, our victory for Tipperary. It was far from that. You know, let's be honest about it. And uh, it was I never... know I was mentioned that night in the Sunday game about James Owen making a mistake. But there's levels to mistakes, you know. Yeah, there's I suppose. Levels here. Like, I, and I, so... I think that he probably, when it's assessed, it's going to be very interesting to see what the assessor says, that like, there's definitely been talk that these fouls within the 21, whether or not the goal-scoring opportunity is clear, it's going to be given. And I, I think that probably there was, there was a diktat that if it's inside the 21, you're going to give this, and we're all going to give this, and it's going to be a united front. But let, let's wait and see what comes from that, because obviously I'd like to hear from him. That would be a great thing. For them to put him forward over the next day or two to but, do some. But are they? Are they going to put him forward? They Have won't. They, ever seen, they won't. You know, they won't. And like, they, you know, that's like, the. To be honest, they're not. Like, you know, it's hard enough to get referees. I can appreciate the referees a very difficult job. You know, but if if Jake Morris was fouled, if 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 a free was given on the corner of the twenty-one, and and Seamus Cannon or Jason Ford popped over the bar, I can guarantee you, Liam Sheedy wouldn't have said a word. Jake Morris wouldn't have said a word. They'd have taken the free. It was complete shock to, to Tipperary as well that they're after being awarded a penalty. Now they'll take it. Yeah. But you know, the application of the law, there has to be there has got to be common sense here. Else games are going to get full games are going to get decided on this. It's one thing conceding well, a goal, but then losing a player. You know. Let's just briefly talk about that. Because what what they've done in soccer is that they've re- removed the red card and penalty. It's now generally just a penalty, unless obviously there's a, there is some instances in which they still give the red card, but mostly if you commit a, a, a foul like that, then they're not giving you the red card, they're giving you the penalty. It's a very significant uh, punishment for yeah. a 10 minute sim bin and a penalty, particularly in a sport like hurling where most teams, maybe with the exception of Wexford, are great at actually using the extra man nowadays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that like the punishment is obviously a goal conceded and a man lost. And the punishment is, is quite severe in terms of the crime. You know, let's be frank about it. Yeah, like it's, it's, it's huge. In, in soccer, you, you get a few, maybe you get six, seven, maybe eight opportunities for a goal in a game. You might come away at one or two if you're lucky. So like if, if it's two on goal, it's a penalty is just reward for that because there's so few and far between. In hurling, you've ample opportunities for goals, you know, and, and for scores. So I think I, I would, I, I'm championing the fact that the symbol, symbol rule has to be abolished entirely. Um, I think the rule was made for the sake of making a rule. I think if a guy is true on goals and he is, there is, there is, as I said, a clear, clear sight to the goalkeeper and he's within 20, even 25 yards from me, give or take, let's say, that's, uh, you, you apply the advantage rule as best you can and then you give a penalty and that's it. You know, that's that's just reward, I think, for, for what for what kind of crime was committed. And I'd say, I don't know, I, I'm not sure actually if this rule is going to be applied into next year's championship, it's going to be, reassessed in Congress, but I would hope they'd look at it, you know. Okay. We, we barely any time left, but I want to talk about the uh, the Limerick-Cork game and the shoot-on-site policy resulted in massive amounts of wides for both teams. What, what's the story here in terms of a trend? Is it what, What's happening in the game where, where uh, really top-quality teams are having massive amounts of wides? Yeah, I think what, what happens is, is that you have um, the, the, sh- the shooting zone or the shooting area has, has, <clears throat> has gotten larger. In years previous, you'll say, if you, if you go back, I have to go back to the mid-90s, up to the early 2000s, within the 45, you'll say, if you draw an arc from inline around a semicircle out to the 45 and back to inline, that was kind of your shooting zone. That then kind of, it, it grew a small bit and came out kind of 55 yards, whereas now it's down as far as your half-back line. You've got guys like Jimmy Burns shooting on site. You've got guys like uh, Tim O'Mahony, you know, less that who, who have this on Kelligan, they have distance in striking, coupled with the ball issue, we'll talk about that again. Um, but I just think defence nowadays are very packed. You've got excellent athletes in defence uh, who can who can read and cover cover markers. You've usually got spare men back, so Limerick usually have Jekyll Hannon sitting back. So trying to trying to hit a free cock forward becomes a very tricky proposition. Hence why Cork shot on sight. Cork did the same kind of thing. They had um, Jim Manley and Mark Coleman sitting back deep, trying to cover the rear inside line, put off supply to Aaron Gillan. And, you know, they were relatively successful with that. But then it created just a pure shooting zone between far from 45 to 45, anywhere within that, it was just shoot on site. And, you know, I, I think Cork will look back and they'll see that from the 55th minute to the 65th minute, that, that game was there for them. You know, that, that game was there for them. And that's going to be a huge learning curve for those. They had a number of shots that were, as you said, they were 70, 80 yards out. They petered out wide. And again, it sucked the life out of the comeback. 
they were they were toying with a four or five point deficit. They needed to get down to three, down to two to make it a right contest, but it didn't happen. And Limerick seed it, closed the game out. Um, the trend itself, I just think the quality of player. There's no such thing as a. I know Kyle Hayes uh, at number seven and Jerry Burns number five on their back. The number means nothing anymore. What you have in your five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, you effectively have eight guys there who can play one of those eight positions. So you have you you have a forward playing Kyle Hayes won man of the match centre forward against Galway in the 2018 final. He's now playing wing back. You know, Declan Hannan started his career full forward for Limerick. He's now playing centre back. So positions mean nothing. It doesn't mean anything what the drummers in their back. So what you have is eight guys who can essentially rotate into any zone and shoot on site. And Limerick's pattern of play and Cork is getting there too. In fairness, them is so good that they create loads of opportunities for each other. And if you have a bit of space, and nowadays if you if you have two seconds on the ball, two and a half seconds, you've got time for a strike. Where <clears throat> so where like. There's a good ratio with the, t- the tackles to possession. So if you have a team who can create three possessions before a tackle is hit, that team is usually winning heavily. So in, in, in Limerick's instance, like they, you can usually apply about a tackle every two possessions. So if Mark Conan gets the ball in possession one, passes to Tim in possession two, they can usually apply a tackle. That's how good they are. But with teams against Limerick, Limerick are so good at creating space that the tackle ratio goes high and they create a plethora of opportunities from shooting from afar. So I just think teams playing against Limerick get sucked into a certain type of game. Um, and it, it becomes a shooting cycle, and Limerick's quality of shooting is just better than everybody else. Simple as that. Right, that is really interesting. I hadn't realised that um, that was the formula that uh, that teams have, and the time on the ball is obviously so important. James, we're getting into really, really brilliant stuff here. Thanks a million. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but we'll definitely come back to, to that in more detail. All of the best part about the Hurling Championship is all the teams are still in it. So that's James Gale giving us his thoughts this morning.